Hey, everybody. It's finally Saturday, 4 p.m. my time. So it's time for the Sound Farmer live stream. Really excited about today's topic. And those of you guys who have joined me for the last live streams, you know that we are trying to cover um, a wide range of topics all relating to being a sound and stable and secure farmer. This is extremely um, important. This is why we work with the sound farmer, why we do what we do, because our heart burns for us personally to live a sound lifestyle and for others as well. Welcome. I'm so glad. Today is also very different in the sense that we are not just live streaming here on YouTube, but we are also on Rumble and we are on Facebook live at the same time. And like the previous times, I will not be able to monitor the chat as much while I talk. But I just want to address real quick the people who might watch this after it has aired and watch the recording. If you're watching this, this um, live stream was scheduled on Saturday, January 28th, but you will still benefit from going through it. Now, welcome again, everybody. Um, I'm really excited for this topic, like I said, and I'm going to do a Q&A with you towards the end of this live stream. We have a lot of ground to cover. I want to um, have this live stream really be of value to you all. So um, we're going to um, gonna go through real quick what the value will be from this live stream. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll talk about the general general idea of the chicken tractor. What what is a chicken tractor? Why would anybody want to use it? And so on. We will talk about challenges within the system. We are going to talk about feed and water, um, like how that works in the chicken tractor. We are not going to do a feed analysis of what to feed poultry so much, even though we could touch on that lightly if you guys want to. We're going to talk about pros and cons of different designs. There are several designs out there. I have used different designs and all of them have pros and cons. We're going to touch on that a little bit. We're also going to be um, discussing a little bit um, what you can have in a chicken tractor. Um, broilers, heritage breeds, ducks, geese. Um, we're going to touch lightly on quail and quail tractors. And we are also going to wrap this all up with um, how this all connects to holistic management and to holistic land planning that you can even understand where on your homestead or where on your farm you should even have a chicken tractor and if that's really right for you. So that's going to be the value that you will get from the stream here. And if I could ask a favor from you all, um, please hit the like button um, wherever you are on Rumble. It's the plus button. It really helps us to spread the word. I think this is information here that lots of people could benefit from. Now, I have a bunch of stuff to share with you. Uh, several pictures, slides that I want to share. But since, you know, we, the first topic was that we wanted to talk about the general idea of the chicken tractor. And since a picture, and especially a motion picture, a video says more than a thousand words, I um, I edited a video for you guys from some old footage of mine when I was farming with Salatin style chicken tractors. I will later explain what exactly that is. And I want to share this video with you guys real quick. And I think that's going to be the perfect introduction to this topic today. So here you guys go. Oh, that's the wrong one. Excuse me. It is actually this one.
All right, that's the little video. I see a bunch of you guys are arriving. Hi to everybody, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I will not be able to pay as much attention to the live chat, but towards the end of the video, to, towards the end of the stream, we will do a Q&A. Now, this video that I just shared with you guys um, was some footage from a video that I aired on our YouTube channel several years ago when we were in Sweden still farming. And at that time, we raised both heritage breed chickens and these turkeys and broilers that you saw in this video in these chicken tractors. Now, you saw kind of in this video the general concept of a chicken tractor. It's, it's not as big as a mobile a stable, as a mobile chicken coop. And it's, it's mobile though, and it's out on pasture and the birds are on the ground, on the grass, they have fresh air, they have sunshine, they have grass. And these chicken tractors are typically moved once a day. And the chickens then move from where they were and where the manure was and is, they, they move to the fresh grass. And that's, that's the general concept. Now, it is, it is important for us to understand that the general concept of the chicken tractor is a holistic concept. What does that mean? Now, um, it's a holistic approach at raising chickens. Why? Because whatever we do as farmers, it has an influence and an impact on so many areas and we we need to manage everything together. We need to manage everything holistically. And so we have to think of the bird's health. We have to think of the land's health. We have to think of our own sanity and our own personal well-being. We need to think of our finances. And all those things went into the thought of developing the chicken tractor. Now, I believe personally that Joel Saladin is most well known for um, the, the chicken tractor, especially his typical style, like you also saw in my video. That's the one I have used the most. And he was looking for a way where you could raise the poultry out on pasture to have a healthy product for the customer, to have a healthy bird a happy bird, something that he enjoyed doing, something that could provide money for him, healthy food for him, something that didn't destroy the land by too much animal impact or the scratching from the chicken and so on. So you see, it was this holistic approach of trying to, to manage all these aspects together. And this is the perfect example for us to understand why a holistic perspective is essential in farming and, and why we need to do this. We need to do this and think of all these aspects. Now, how do you do that? Well, holistic management provides a framework for us, um, for, especially for farmers, that we can make sure that when we make decisions, we can think of all these things. That's the power of holistic management. And so one issue that we have, for example, in industrial agriculture or in general, let, let me say this, in, in, in agriculture, when I've been um, at different farms, both in Sweden and in Austria, you, you get on a regular basis, you have people who come visit you on the farm. Uh, sometimes it's a veterinarian, maybe not because of a sick animal, but a government um, inspector who is a veterinarian who is looking for animal welfare. Maybe you have for your certification for being organic, you have a person come, um, you know, there, there's just a lot of people that come visit your farm and everybody else might be, I, I don't like the word, but they might be an expert in their area, right? Uh, the vet cares so much about the animal being healthy. Uh, you, you have the biologist who comes and he cares so much about your farm, um, you know, that the chickens don't don't poop everywhere and that they don't scratch up all the plants and eat all the insects. And then you have, you know, 
the, the organic certifier who comes and he is all concerned that you keep the, the rules and regulations and so on and so on. But it is you as the farmer who has to bring all of those things together and deal with all of them and manage them all. And that's an incredible challenge. And not just that, on top of that, you have to manage your finances and what your life, your family. Okay. And the chicken tractor was Joel Salatin's approach at um, doing this holistically all together. And so what he accomplished and the general idea of it is that you, you first of all, don't rob the chicken of what it is created for. The Joel Salatin calls this the chicken is of the chicken. The chicken wants to scratch. The chicken wants to lay in the sun and take baths, dust baths, and so on. And so he knew he needed the chicken outside. Now, when the chickens free range, they poop everywhere. In the area where they roam, they eat all the insects. They eat all the frogs and lizards and everything, right? They scratch up the ground. It's a nightmare. So he thought, I need to confine them. Also, if they free range, the predators get them. So what did he do? Well, he created a little pen. But then if that would stand on one spot all the time, that would be very bad and damaging for that ground underneath. Manure, the manure lobe would get very big and the chicken would get sick again. So what did he do? He created a small poultry pen that was mobile. And that's basically the chicken tractor. He also enjoyed doing it. He could create a premium product because the chickens were healthy, the chickens were happy. It was healing the land, improving, improving his land, and he enjoyed doing it, and it was beneficial for his wallet, for his finances. He could provide for his family because um, with not too much work, he was able to create an amazing product, and he could also create healthy food for himself and for his customer. So you think you see all these aspects um, were considered and thought about in this process, and that's why the chicken tractor is 100% a holistic approach to raising chicken. And I do not know of a better concept to do that than a chicken tractor when it comes to meat chicken. There are a lot of people out there who, who come with suggestions and free ranging and doing different kinds of things. But yes, if you focus on just one thing, maybe it would be nicer for the chicken if they had 10 times as much space to run around, right? It would be nicer for the farmer if you didn't have to move this every day and have that extra work. But all these approaches that I've heard so far, all these suggestions that have come from other people, they have never been able to consider all of these aspects holistically. And I think the chicken tractor, that is really the power. Yes, it is a compromise in, in, in some or maybe a little bit in all of the areas because we have to combine the farmer's interests, the farmer's finances, the land's health, the animal welfare, the customers, what they want. We have to combine that all. And in order to do so, we cannot be 100% everywhere but I believe the chicken tractor is, is close to it. Okay, so that's the general idea of the chicken tractor. And, you know, obviously there are some challenges with this. So you saw in the video that this is outside, okay? Now, one challenge can be the climate. You understand if, if there is a reason why the industrial agriculture places their chickens in confined big houses because no predator can get there and they can somehow uh, control the climate in there. So I've been farming in um, colder climate in Sweden and I want to show you guys a picture real quick. Um, we're going to go through this here in a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to show you this one picture here. Look at this. This was me waking up one morning. This was May, I believe, in Sweden. I woke up and this is how it looked out on pasture with my chicken tractors. <laughs> and so you, you, you see the problem, right? Wind, 
um, heavy rains where, where water starts running on the pasture, on the field, can be an issue with these chickens. When they get wet, cold, and it's drafty at the same time, chickens are in trouble. Okay? But it's, it's, not, just, it's not just the cold, but also when you farm in really hot climates, can that be an issue? So um, you have to actually adapt these chicken tractors a little bit, depending on where you are. So where, where we were in Sweden, we added some extra windbreak on the inside. I know Richard Perkins, who wasn't farming too far from us, he did the same thing. He added a little bit of um, plastic um, um, foil, or I don't know the proper English term, but you know basically what you put on a greenhouse tunnel. And, and gave them a little bit of a windbreak. Joel Salatin has an opening in the back that he can open up on hot days. So the air goes through and he actually on really hot days waters them down a little bit. So this, this is definitely a challenge in this system when you have your chickens out there, um, is the weather, the elements, right? But there are ways to do this. And that's why I also wanna say again, you need to see your holistic context, what it is you want, what the climate you're in and all those things combine and then see is, does a chicken tractor make sense to you? And if what chicken tractor makes sense to you and do I need to make some changes? So um, we are gonna continue to talk about other challenges. Let me remove this from the live stream here a little bit. And another challenge with the chicken tractor can be predators. Now, when I first learned about chicken tractors, got in touch with that, it was through Joel Salatin. There are some um, YouTube videos out there, but I also bought his book, Pastured Poultry Profit. And I read through this, I studied it. And he said that he has never had or, or in all of his years, and he has done this for decades now, I think he said one time has he had a predator inside the chicken tractor. He once had a fox who repeatedly would try to reach through the wire and, and he always got like a drumstick from a chicken. And of course it caused a lot of stress and everything. And what Joel Salatin did is he shot that fox, okay? Sometimes you have to do that. Now, he otherwise he said he had never had one in the chicken tractor. So I did the same thing. When I did it, everybody around me told me I would lose all my chickens, that the predator would go in there. And we had a lot of foxes, we had badgers, we had all kinds of predators where we lived. I have never lost a chicken from predator within the chicken tractor. I have had a predator pull off rusty um, nails and wire from my chicken tractor and get in. And that was my fault for not being on top of that. But I've never had a predator inside um, the chicken tractor and kill, um, kill chickens there. Now, I know from um, people I've talked to, from followers and viewers on our channel, and also from the chat here, I see that, that there are people who have had issues with this, okay? Now, there are ways to deal with this. This can be a challenge. I'm not saying it will never be. It can be a challenge, especially if you live in an area where the, the um, ecosystem is very unbalanced, where, you know, monocrop farming and, and, and wrong forest management and all of that has just destroyed the natural habitat and the natural prey for these predators. Your pressure on your farm and on the chicken tractor will just be significantly higher. Okay, that, that can be a problem. Now it can be solved. When we have tested out different kinds of chicken tractors, we actually put an electric fence wire about four inches, four inches away from, and four inches from the ground and four inches from the, from the ch chicken tractor, put it around it and put a little solar powered energizer on there and no animal could have gone there. They, they, they had no room to be um, between the wire and the chicken tractor. To, they, they wouldn't have dug under because the wire was there. 
And we did that for a couple of weeks. And we are, we looked around the area and we saw no no tracks, no nothing, no um, you know, right, no attempts to dig into the chicken tractor. And so we did it without it, and that worked as well. So I've never had those issues, but I've heard from people they do. You could do that with the electric wire. Guardian dogs work great. There are ways to do that. You have to um, adapt to your situation, okay? You have to adapt to your situation. There are ways of doing it because there are people doing it. Um, what I have found is that once the chicken tractor, if, if you place it somewhere, and or e even stationary coops, okay, a, a normal permanent chicken coop will have a very high predator pressure because there's no change. The predators will come and they will they will look and they will check it out and if nothing changes you know they come back the next day nothing changes and then they will dig under the 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 fence and they will try to get into the coop but this constant movement of the chicken tractor is what makes the big difference for for the um for the predators you move the chicken tractor constantly every day you spread your scent there every day. If you have a dog that walks with you while you do chores, the dog smell is there every day, fresh. And so the predator that is normally careful will be very careful to not um, attack the chicken tractor. So you can do you can do different things there. I want to encourage you. Uh, don't give up. There are ways to do this. Every farmer has to deal with predators to a certain extent. And um, I've had my fair share of it. But we have talked about the climate, the, the conditions, the elements of the wild, and the predator issue as challenges of a chicken tractor system. But in my honest opinion, if you are into pastured poultry and want to sell it to customers, if it's not just for your own use for growing food, but if you want to sell it and make a living off of it, your biggest challenge with a chicken tractor will not be the weather and will not be the predator, but it will be your customer. And here's the reason why. A lot of people who would come to your farm, they, they, they know from the store, they know the concept of free range, right? That's everybody's free range chicken, free range but they don't know what that does to the insect. They don't know what that does to the overgrazing and scratching. If, if you look at organically certified farms that have big stables and they have, um, you know, like an acre of, of land connected to the stable where the chickens free range, it looks like a desert. You know, the, the chickens walk always where they poop. They eat everything around there. They, they scratch it all up if it rains. It's a nightmare. That's free range, guys. That, that's that's the bad side of free range. There, there are good ways to do it as well. But um, the, the, the challenge is that the customer doesn't understand the concept of the chicken tractor. They will come to your farm or they will see pictures of it. And for them, it looks like small confined cages. Now, you have a lot of explaining to do there as the farmer, as the producer, okay? You have, you have a hard and challenging job uphill to explain to the customer why the chicken tractor system is good for the land, is good for the chicken, is, you know, why, why it is a good system. That is hard to do, trust me. I've had many conversations like that. People don't understand it. Because when, when you look at the chicken tractor, and, and here in, in Europe, the chicken tractor cannot be organically certified. And in, in, in Austria, organically grown chicken are required to at all times have a certain amount of square space that they can roam on. Now, in a, the, the chickens in a chicken tractor, okay, they have, they cover more space in their lifetime with the daily moves 
then organic chickens are on here in Austria. But because they don't have access to that space permanently, it is not possible to even um, certify a chicken tractor organically here. And there you see again the, what I said earlier, how you know the veterinarian says this and the, the, the certifier says this and the customer says this and the farmer says this and the chicken tractor is a holistic approach to raising chickens that tries to combine all of these issues, but there are challenges with it, okay? And you have to, you have to explain that to the customer. They will not understand this. They do not understand the moving away from the manure without you explaining. They don't understand that behind the chicken tractor, the land needs to recover and now it has time to recover. Okay, they need to understand that these chickens get fresh insects and all that every day. But if they would walk at the same spot, even if you gave them, you know, several hundred square feet each, that would not be not be good. This way you can protect them, you can control them and so on. That will be a big challenge. And I, I want to warn you, don't underestimate this. Don't underestimate... Um, you know, trying to convince your customer of that. Okay, that, that can be a big challenge. Okay, let's move on. Feed and water. Um, let me add the video real quick to the stream that we were looking at earlier, okay? And I wanna show you guys so these are the Chol Salads and Sod Chicken Tractors. We're going to talk about the different designs in a little bit. But here you see, um, this is a waterer that's being gravity fed from this bucket. And this is important because I have never farmed on completely um, flat land. There has always been a bit of a slope or here in Austria, steep mountain sides. And this because it's hanging off of this middle beam here is always level, okay? Now it's important that you realize depending on where you will keep your chicken tractor that you need to have somehow a way to bring water to, to these chickens. I fill up these buckets. I don't know if in this video if there was like some yeah, I think at some point you could see me filling it up with water. Let me see here. There, I fill it up with a hose here, you can see. So this was close enough. I connected two 50 yard hoses um, and I was able to, to fill up these buckets. And I had, in the summer, I had to do it twice a day. But you need to understand this. Um, yes, it's a mobile system, but you know, where where do you have water access? How do you bring the water to these? chickens and the same with the feed need to transport the feed i had to carry heavy buckets of feed here to these to these uh chickens and and some turkeys in here and you see there is a feeder i'll i will show you i fill them up and then i place them under the covered part of the roof okay and here you go that's the feeder Okay, you can build your own feeder. I did that also for a very long time. There are um, many ways to, to, to feed them in there, but you need to have enough feeder space for all those chickens. But my, my main point for you guys is think about how are you going to get the feed there? How are you going to get the water there? It's a very important thing. Now, these waterers, um, you know, you can buy them different designs that I think they're called bell waterers and it's, it's an awesome thing. Normally you connect them to like a water system, low pressure, but Joel Salatin came up with a solution where he uses these buckets, connects the hose to it. Some people say black buckets because then they don't, um, they, they have no algae growing in it, but then the water is just so hot in the summer. I just used white buckets and I had one of these dish brushes, you know, that you have at your kitchen sink uh, that you can buy for like a dollar somewhere. Uh, I had one of those by my chicken tractors. And so every few days I just uh, scrubbed the, the bucket clean, 
and, and cleaned it all out. Now with those waters, also don't forget, very common mistake, make sure the this um, valve works, right? Make sure the water is actually running because you will have some very stressed and very thirsty birds in the chicken tractor. If you come there in the afternoon and they have been without water all day long, these guys eat a lot, they need to drink a lot and that stuff needs to work. So don't stress your routine there. Make sure that the water works. So um, those are just some, some things to consider. Um, now, I want, I want to touch on something real quick. It's not chicken tractor specific, but since we're talking about poultry and pasture poultry, I just want to mention this real quick. Feed has gotten so expensive. Okay, let's not talk about why that is and the political control and all of that. Everybody has their opinion on that. But the fact is, it has. Um, people are going out of business. Okay. And, and I love the pasture poultry concept. I love the chicken tractor concept. Joel Salatin, that's his favorite thing that he recommends young beginner farmers, farmers to do. Quick return of money, low um, infrastructure costs to start with. And you can do this. But listen, you are dependent on high input feed. Now, there are some people out there who have this weird concept and thought that if you put them in here, they just live off the pasture. That is not true. Okay. Chickens, if you want to raise them in a, in a serious amount of number that you can earn any kind of money with it, they will not be able to live just off of the pasture. They need um, high quality protein and chickens have animal protein that they need. And I'm telling you guys, Every homesteader will always wants to start with chickens. The cost of feed is insane. It has gone up so much and the feed cost can eat you up. You're thinking, oh, this is looking good. I can sell these eggs and you, you're happy when you sell it. But then when the feed bill comes, you just want to go drown yourself. I, I've been there. I've done that. Okay. And it has gotten a lot worse since then, especially when you start and you can only buy feed in small quantities, you know, these little bags, forget them. I, I, I mean, you, you pay, it's, it's unbelievable what you have to pay. Try to work together with other neighbors and, and buy in bulk or, or go to a farmer and ask him or her if you can buy some feed from them. Um, otherwise, let me tell you, think about it twice, how much you want to do this. I was consulting a, a beginner farmer in Germany on this. And um, he started out on a lot of um, he, like, obviously, you know, a lot of people do this with eggs and all that. And, and then he was moving to a bigger farm, more land. And he said, what should I continue with? And I said, you know what? And this was just after the war in Ukraine started and all these prices started skyrocketing and, and, and feed prices and whatnot. And I was telling him, be careful, you know, be careful because the, the feed prices are going up like crazy. And my focus on our farm in the States, if God gives us one, will be on grass-fed um, products. Like, like sunshine and rain do not cost more this year than they did two years ago, guys. Okay? doesn't matter who becomes president. It doesn't matter what the fuel cost is. Sunshine and rain will be the same. And... That's what you have to consider. So when you have chicken, a chicken tractor and you have broilers in there, they might pick up some 10% of their feed off the pasture. But that doesn't mean they will eat less of your feed. That means you can feed them less. You have to feed them less. Okay. And then they can, they will go for the insects. They will go for the grasses and herbs and all of that. And that has a big health benefit to them but the feed cost is still a lot. Now, you also have to take the fertility that that creates into account, okay? But, I, but I'm just saying, think about it. Think about it and, and plan that through, okay? So guys, I see you're quite active in the comments here. I will 
tend to the comments at the end of this live stream, we're going to um, do a Q&A. And if you have some specific comments or specific questions for me, um, save them up for then and we'll try to address them. The next thing I want to talk about is the different um, designs and pros and cons of different designs. Now, let me add my picture pictures here to the stream. So there is the Salatin style chicken tractor. Okay, this is a picture from when we were farming in Sweden. We had three of those chicken tractors and we ran them together. And, and these are the exact dimensions and pretty much the same build as Joel Salatin's. We didn't have the opening in the back that we could like open up in, in hot weather because it was just such a temperate climate that we were in. This is an incredible design and Joel Salatin doesn't like any other designs and he swears by it. Um, here's my input on it. I love it, but not for everything. And you know, despite Charles Salatin saying that it is stable in windstorms, we got some severe windstorms in Sweden. And one time the entire roof blew off for me. Um, you can easily fix that by just putting some rubber straps on the sides here. No problem. But just be aware of that. Okay. You have to do your own adjustment to this kind of system. These things are great. They're stable. Um, but I only like these four broilers. Okay. And the reason that is, is because the broilers are these slow, heavy things that come running to you when they think they're going to get feed. They are always hungry. So you open up this, this front area here and all the broilers will come running to you on the day of, of processing and you can easily grab them and easily take them out of there. Now, I have raised heritage breeds in there. Not just the breasts. I've also raised um, Plymouth Rock. I've raised Sussex. I've raised um, New Hampshire, the Australorp, and, and some German breeds. We all had them in there. And let me tell you, those guys are fast. They, are not, they don't come running to you the same way. And boy, we had to like crawl under that thing. We had to try to get them out there. It was a stress momentum for the bird right before processing. It was just hard for us. We were crawling in the manure. It was a pain. It, it just didn't work, okay? And so I would say if, if you want to work with broilers, this is a great system. I mean, it's proven for years. If something breaks on the wood, you can just fix it with a scrap piece of wood and some screws, no problem. I built these. I got free scrap aluminum roofing from a neighbor's barn that he was taking down. Um, the wire was cheap. I used some large wood. I didn't even didn't even use pressure treated wood for, for one, I think I did. I was really able to keep the cost down on this thing and, and they work, okay? You saw that on the design, um, on this design, you need either a dolly to move them or what I built here, you can see this on the video again, I built this little sled, okay, um, or skid that, that, you know, I put that under there to lift it off the ground and then I was able to move this forward. I like that a lot more than the dolly that Chil Salatin described and a lot of other people describe. Okay, and you can see here, let me go back a, a split second here. Um, I put these squares on the top so no chicken would be run over by, by, this, um, by this sled. Um, they would be bumped against their chest and move forward and not get their legs caught under here. That was my design. It worked great. Um, was really happy with it. It might have been a little easier to move this thing um, with the dolly you see here. I have to put my weight in there a lot. Um, there are some people who might have a hard time moving these things. Okay. And Charles Salatin has said that he wouldn't mind building these bigger, um, but then they would get too heavy. Okay. Now, um, we let's go back to this. So 
so there are some pros and cons with this. I would not use this for layers. Um, yes, you can do layers in a chicken tractor. Um, I would not use this for heritage breed birds. It's harder to get them out as a stress momentum. And I would not use this for ducks or geese either. Turkeys actually work great up till eight weeks. Um, then you can have them in there longer, but, but then they get too tall. Okay. So let's look at some different designs here. Um, let's look at some different designs. So we have another very famous chicken tractor. And, and forgive me, I just took some screenshots off the internet here. This is John Soskovich and one of the most popular chicken tractors out there among homesteaders. This is a chicken tractor that you can walk into and stand in and you can, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit different. You see, it's a, it's a different frame. It's a plastic covering. And guys, this thing works great. It works awesome. And I love that you're able to walk in there. Let me show you a similar design that I worked with here in Europe. Look at this one. Very much the same concept. The Chancescovich one, you have to build. This one, you can buy off the internet. Here in Germany, uh, in, not in Germany, in, in, in Europe in general, in Austria, Sweden, Germany, everywhere, you can order this off of certain websites. And this thing costs about $300, okay? You have to do some adjustments to it. You have to put a, a plastic um, tarp over it because the one that comes with it is worthless. And... Um, you have to add, because it's not meant to be mobile, you know, but you make it mobile, you have to add some, some rope or wire here so that you can move it with. And this thing is super crazy light, guys. That is a pro and a con. My kids could move that easily, easily. It is so light that I've never had to use a dolly or a, or a sled under it to get it off the ground. You can just drag it over the ground. Only thing is if there's a big bump from, from ants or a plant, it will get stuck on it but you can lift it over carefully. But this thing is so much lighter and easier to move. But the calm with that is that that thing blows away if it's windy. So what did I do? I just took, let me make my um, screen a little bigger so you see. So I took short pieces of rebar, like a foot, a foot and a half. And I just had those there and I put them at an angle. So let's say this is the, this is the, um, the bottom pipe of the chicken tractor, then I would put the rebar over like this. And I would do that in all four corners. Would take me 20 seconds to do. And the chicken tractor was anchored into the ground. The I'm telling you guys, the, the design of this, that you can walk in there, that you can stand in there, you can go to the back, bring the chickens out to the front, like in the Chancescovich kind style chicken tractor. It's so worth taking these extra 20 minutes to, to um, anchor down this chicken tractor after moving. And I didn't even do that every day. I, I just did it when I knew it was a windy day and it was gonna get windy or there was a risk for thunderstorms or something. That's when I put this rebar into the corners and, and pinned down this chicken tractor. Okay, but I love this design. It's metal. If something breaks on it, we had a at the, at the farm I worked on here in Austria, we had a, an employee drive into the corner with a front end loader. It was trashed. I mean, there's no way of fixing that easily. This is galvanized steel um, that that, you know, you can't just fix that. So that's that's not good. But if you if you take care of it, um, it's not a problem. Um, I'm going to address comments later, but I just see one comment real quick where somebody's saying rain would soak the chickens with this design of tractor. Um, no, because um, like I said earlier, you buy another tarp and you cover it to the front. For me, I had the back part covered and I had a roost. These were actually some layers here. Um, I think I'm not quite sure yet. And um, they, they didn't get soaked, they went to the back, but you can buy a tarp and cover this thing all the way to the front, no problem, okay? Um, so <clears throat> there are ways you can do adjustments to this so that it fits you. If you get strong winds and rain coming horizontally, um, then put, put some wire on the sides, 
right? So you have this design and you have the Chancescovich design. They're very similar. Um, let me show you guys. This here is Richard Perkins design. Those, is, uh, a lot of you guys, <coughs> excuse me. A lot of you guys know Richard Perkins, um, awesome regenerative farmer uh, farming in Sweden. He came up with his own design and he uses this thing as, as cover against bad weather. And then he lets them roam in a bigger area outside and he um, puts electric poultry netting around it. Now I have never tried this design myself. Um, it can house more birds and the birds have more room. They can eat more grass. They get more movement. But I've talked to somebody else, um, a fellow um, educator from the Savory Institute who has been using this. And he says this, he loves this design. He says this is so much better than the chill salad and design even. Um, I, I don't know. I, I have never used it. I can't say either. But it's another design out there. If you're interested in that, you know, check out some of Richard Perkins' videos or buy his book, Regenerative Agriculture. Um, he has some information for you guys there. I have a friend here in Austria who is quite well known for um, this kind of farming. Um, I took these pictures off his homepage as screenshots. I hope he doesn't get mad at me. <laughs> um, he builds his chicken tractors out of metal. I do not know the weight of them, but you can see here, this is like welded wire. You have this structure here is all metal. And I've seen other people. I, I, I saw some folks in California, I believe, they just had such uh, issues with coyotes that they also built stronger, firmer metal chicken tractors. Okay. People get creative. The, the principle remains the same. So... Um, you know, the sky is the limit, guys. I had the approach when I first wanted to try the chicken tractor that Joel Salatin has been at this for a very long time. And he has thought about things that I don't even know about. And I'm just going to go with that. And that was a very good approach. And that really helped me. And then I um, could do adjustments to my needs. Okay. And the reason... Let me show you guys this real quick again here. The reason I ended up with a sled, this thing under, instead of a dolly, was not so much because I thought uh, this is much better than a dolly, but I didn't have money or the, the skill or the, the material to build a dolly. And this I could put together in my free time in a few minutes with scrap wood that we had. It was actually out of pressure treated wood. Um, that I had laying around that we couldn't have used for anything else. And, and it worked great. And I saved a lot of money. Um, so, yeah. Guys, again, I'm going to address you all in the chat real quick. I will take a look at your questions when I've gone through this material and, and answer them. So please save them for later and send them my way when we go to the Q&A section of this video. Um, also, if I could ask a favor, push the plus or thumbs up button or the like button, whether you are on Rumble, Facebook, or YouTube, we are streaming at all platforms at the same time and help us spread the news about this. I think a lot of people could benefit from this. Okay, so um, this was another design here. This is also my friend um, on his farm. This is from above. He built some square, okay? Mine were 10 feet by 12 feet like the Salatin style ones, he built some square, otherwise same principle. And here you see the daily moves, right? He always moves them on one after the other. I can show you a picture. This is Charles Salatin on his farm. It's a little bit small here. Uh, maybe I can make it bigger, a little bit bigger. This is how he moves them every day. And you see how quickly it greens up right behind the chicken tractors. It's just amazing. Um, how that works. Um, I can show you a picture of my three chicken tractors from a bird's view um, in Sweden. This is a really bad satellite image. This was the farm in Sweden that we farmed. But you see here, I drove like this and then did a turn. This was a hay field. I needed some extra nutrient input here. 
And so we had the chicken tractors here and um, that's, that's how it worked. It was a very dry summer. So otherwise this would have all been green already, you know, but this is, this is how it worked. Okay. Different designs. Now let me talk about this. This is not a chicken tractor. This is a quail tractor. Okay. So let's move on to the next section. Um, the second to last element of this live stream before we go to the Q and a, um, let's talk about the poultry in general. It's called a chicken tractor, but I have raised geese. I've raised ducks. I've raised, um, chicken, both heritage and broiler. I've had layers in there. Um, you can do that. Okay. And I'm going to touch real quick on the cos and bronze, uh, <laughs> the, the pros and cons with this. Um, this year, what you see on the picture is a quail tractor. Why is it different for quail? Quail, you can also race in a tractor, uh, so to speak, but it's a quail tractor. You either have to have it extremely low that they don't fly up, or you need to have it high like this, six feet high at least. Because the quail, when they get spooked, they will take off if they have the room to, and if it's like anywhere between one foot and, and five feet, they will break their neck or break something if they hit the top, okay? So you, a quail tractor needs to be either extremely low or you need to have this, this tall like you can see here on the picture. And then you can raise quail this way and move it daily. Same principle, same everything. And quail is awesome because they're so quiet. Guys, you can do this in your backyard. You can do this in the city. <laughs> I don't know about the regulations, but, um, you know, from a poultry standpoint, quail is the way to go. Rabbits are even quieter. But this is this is quails, okay, or quail. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about other poultry. In this <clears throat> chicken tractor, <clears throat> excuse me, I should have brought some water. In this chicken tractor, um, we raised ducks this summer, this past summer. Um, and, and the setup needs to be a little bit different. Now, chicken tractors work the best for chickens. I have to say that they do work for ducks and geese and Turkey. Turkey work great too, till a certain age. But here, here was my experience with chickens, um, excuse me, with ducks, um, you don't use this waterer. You can see here that I use the same waterer here. I brought them from Sweden and the farmer on this farm in Austria here took them over actually. Here I'm instructing one of the workers on the farm on this picture. They are also hanging there, but that's not enough for the, for the ducks. So what did we do? Well, we put in um, a... a um, what do you call this? A, a, a bin <laughs> that, that the ducks could drink and swim in. Okay. Now, what was that? I was looking forever. How, how can I do this? We had an automated water on it and a hose connected. We had um, on this farm when I was on there, I installed a water system where we had 30 yards between each um, point Quick, quick valve where you could just plug in a hose and you had water everywhere on the farm. Before, before I came, they would always use a, a you know, um, one cubic meter water tank. I, I don't know what that is, like 250, 300 gallon or something, um, and drive it there and carry buckets in the summer. And it was just a, a nightmare. So, south facing slopes, super hot, difficult. So one of the first things I did there, I tapped the spring for them. We installed the, the water tanks. And then we laid about two to three kilometers of pipe um, on the farm. And we had access points with uh, Plasson quick valves every 30 meters. So we could plug in a hose anywhere on the farm and reach every corner of the farm. It was all gravity fed system, it was amazing. So we were able to put in a little swimming and drinking place for the ducks with an automated uh, water valve that would um, control the level. Now, two things, what, what did we use for those ducks? Well, um, it is, 
um, you, you you guys know where sheep you can buy these these things. I don't I don't know the English term right now. It kills me. But but where sheep get their foot baths and sometimes farmers when they have illnesses on their on the sheep's hoofs they they have the sheep walk through these and there's some kind of like uh, medical um, stuff in there that that kills any gunk on their feet. <laughs> Sorry, I, I am tired right now. I don't know how to express myself properly here. But but those things for the foot baths of the sheep, they're just very, um, very sturdy and strong. Okay, they last forever. They are durable. They cost a little bit, but they last. And then we just bought for some 10 or $15 a, 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 a valve that we could connect the hose to, installed that in there, <clears throat> and we had water. It was amazing. OK, but then we had the issue of this farm was sloping. Here we are standing at pretty much the only level place on the entire farm. And a lot of it, the chicken tractor would stand at an angle. And what we did um, with our waters on that farm in general, and I'm going to remove this real quick so you can see this. I explained this in one of our videos that we aired this last summer on that farm. We, um, I took rebar, two standing pieces. And then I welded a, a piece of metal to it and we used those and we could put them on each corner. So let's say, I'm gonna use my phone here. So let's say um, this is it, right? It's a slope and we used to put it under each corner. And so when the water, this is the mountain, and the water was standing like this, it was level because the rebar would be holding it here. So with just a few pieces of rebar, we were able to level out the water for the sheep and for the ducks anywhere on the property. And it was a, a, a quite steep slope, okay? Um, more than probably most of you guys have um, on your land. And it worked great, okay? So um, that's what we did when we did ducks in a chicken tractor. Now, let me say again, it's not ideal. OK, I didn't like racing ducks and geese and chicken tractors because they make a big mess. And I feel like they have also a very different personality. They, they somehow want more room. OK, they don't like being in that as much. Chickens don't seem to care so much. And so I, I think racing ducks, um, we can come up with better systems and use electric poultry netting. It works. It's it it is possible, but it's not not the best. Okay, so guys, um, let me see here. One more thing before we start going into the Q and A. We've covered a lot of ground. If you have tuned in later, watch from the beginning. Once this live stream um, is posted and uploaded as a normal video. Um, there's a lot of information here that a lot of you guys can benefit from. I truly believe that. Um, the last, I, I want to end, before we go to the question and answer, I want to end with what I started with. I started this live stream by saying the chicken tractor is a holistic approach to raising meat chickens. Why? Because Joel Salatin, he wanted to do something that he enjoyed that would um, be financially okay, low cost infrastructure, um, good return of money. But he also wanted something that was good for the bird, something that was good for the land, something that was healthy for the customer. He thought of all those things. So he had to have a holistic approach. He didn't just think of how can I make money with chickens, right? We understand that all. He didn't think of just um, all I want is a, the chicken to be as happy as can be and, you know, well, what about your economy? What about your, uh, you know, routine, your workload, all of that? No, it was a holistic approach to raising chickens. Now, it doesn't end there. And this is what I, wanna, what I want to, to end with um, before we go to the Q&A is um, that you, if you're interested in raising poultry and keeping chickens in, in chicken tractors, which I guess you are because you're watching this, you need to have a way of thinking of your life 
and everything involved in it, your finances, your farm, your land, your climate, your potential customers, your cost of feed and all of that, you need to think of that to, and, and, and make decisions that take all of that into account so that you can be sure that the chicken tractor A is something that is good for you, that, that you enjoy. Maybe you don't want to go out there every morning in any kind of weather, right? And so on. And, and how can you do this? That is where holistic management comes in, guys. That's why it's so important. Holistic management is not just a tool for you that you can use as you please. Holistic management is what you are all trying to do on your farms. You are all trying to combine all these things in life, and you know you need to. You know you need to think of your land and your animals and your money and your, your spouse and family, and you need to think of all of that. And holistic management provides a help and a framework for you to do that in a good way. And it has been proven to, to lead you and keep you on track for decades. Okay, Many successful stories there. And that's what I want to recommend to you guys and take home from this. In holistic management, you will, you will have a framework that can show you whether or not chicken tractors are right for you. It can show you which design of chicken tractor can be right for you when you go, when you ask that, uh, check that decision in the context check. And holistic land planning, a very important planning procedure in holistic management framework helps you to understand how do you need to build your land? How do you need to build your homestead um, depending on where you want the chicken tractors to be in the future? Do you want to have more chicken tractors in the future? And, and the holistic land plan will help you that you don't plant or build something somewhere where it then blocks you or hinders you from you know, doing those kind of things on your farm and on your land. And so I can't stress this enough. This was today a how-to video and, and, and really focused on the chicken tractor. And all of that is good and valuable information. But you have to manage everything together. It's not just the chicken tractor. So don't focus just on the chicken tractor. You need to, you need to think of the chicken tractor in light of your land, your climate, your family, and so on. We, have, we, we just mentioned this. So I cannot stress enough educate and train yourself in managing holistically. And this is now a shameless self-promotion. I have created a video course for people who really need to just get an overview of it and, and want to know what don't want to spend too much money and don't have the time to right away go into an in-depth training with holistic management. And if, if you're wondering, is that something for me? Yes or no. That's why I've created a low priced course so people can see if holistic management is something that they want to do and what it is and why it matters. So you can go to our website and um, you, can, um, you can find the video course there. You can learn about it. I really think you can benefit from that. I think it, the whole, managing holistically with holistic management framework is what can prove to be the key for long lasting success and joy on your homestead. Okay, guys, let's dive into the Q&A. I've had a bunch of questions um, posted here in the chat. I've seen that. Um, but if you guys have some questions, and I know there's a little bit of a delay here between me saying it and the actual live stream, it's like 10 seconds or something. But um, please send me some questions right now. If you are watching on Rumble, we are right now streaming live on Facebook and YouTube and Rumble. I do not see your comments. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I will try to reply to some comments on Rumble after if there are, but comments from Facebook and comments from YouTube show up on my streaming software here so I can address them. And if I don't see any questions come up now, I will try to go back and <clears throat> look at some other questions that were posted earlier. Okay. So feel free, guys. There's a little bit of a delay here until the streaming software has picked this up. I see one question here. How well 
I can I can show this real quick. Okay. How well does this Richard Perkins tractor design hold up and not get lifted during strong winds? Well, that's a very good question. I do not have the answer to it because I've never tried or tested this design myself. I would have to ask a couple of friends who have worked with this design. Um, but I would think that in strong windstorms, there's a risk of it blowing away and you would have to think of a solution of tying that down. Now, usually, you know, if there's a risk of a thunderstorm or of a strong um, windstorm, and then you can that day go and tie that down. For example, if you would do it the same here with a rebar, like I, um, I anchored down my chicken tractor design, just put them, you know, have them always there on the chicken tractor and um, that you just have to grab them and, you know, fasten down the wheels or something. That's, that's what I would recommend. Okay. Um, another question here. Do you provide dust baths for your birds or do they make their own? In the chicken tractor, I didn't. Um, they sometimes scratched up some space um, if they came to like a place where ants had been and it was like, you know, the ants dig these little dirt pile um, hills, they would use that and, and do all of that. But for my layers, I, um, depending on where they were, what they were doing at the time, I provided that. But I was actually more monitoring my flock to see how they were doing. And if I saw that there was an issue, some health issues, then I would do that. And what I did is one third sawdust, one third ashes and one third sand. And that works quite well for the chickens. They seem to like that. They seem to love that. But, um, you know, do it as you please. You can provide that by law here in Europe. In most places you have to provide that. Um, but often they also make their, their own, especially in stationary coops, it shouldn't be a problem, okay? Um, next question, would you ever hardwire the bottom? Do they have to have free access to grass? Well, that's one of the points of the whole design is that they do have that access to the grass that they can, um, grace and scratch when you do rabbits in a rabbit tractor which is a whole nother subject then you need to have something at the bottom because they will dig out okay the rabbits will dig out of the tractor but it can't it's still it's a, it's a bit of a challenge so if if you make it too tight they can't eat grass because the whole point of a rabbit tractor is that the rabbits can almost, you know, just eat the grass and, and, and do thrive on it. Not like the chickens who need all that feed. So they need to have access to the grass. But if you do it too big, so the grass can still look through, then the rabbit's feet get stuck when you move the rabbit tractor. So what Charles Salatin came up with, he has these wooden things all along the floor that just move like this. And so the rabbit's feet don't get stuck, but they can still reach reach the grass. For chickens, I would not hardwire the bottom at all. I think it would just catch on things. I think it would just be a pain. It's extra work. It's extra cost. And it's very unnecessary. You want the chickens also to be able to scratch, right? Um, so <clears throat> yeah, I, I wouldn't do that. Um, I, I, I suppose you're asked that question because you're wondering because, because of predators. Well, if you have issues with predators getting into the chicken tractor, then there is something else that needs to be done. Okay, I can't tell you for sure what, but the predator shouldn't shouldn't try to go in like that. And and I earlier when I covered predator issues on this live stream, I said one solution is put electric fence posts and an uh, electric hot wire four inches from the ground, four inches away from the chicken tractor, put a little solar powered um, energizer there and that'll keep the, all the predators from digging under it. Works, works well in that sense. Okay. Let's see here. Um, 
got a question here that's not directly related to chicken tractors. I can look at that after. Um, okay, I have, a, I have a couple questions here, not related to chicken tractors, but related to chicken and poultry. I'll take both of them. So what is your thoughts on sprouting grains? Is it beneficial for the chickens? If so, what kind of grains would you recommend? I mean, yes, it is beneficial, but here's the crazy thing. You have some people out there who are such strong... They're, they're just so, um, they're so strong opinionated about you need to ferment the chicken's feet. You need to ferment the chicken's feet. You need to soak the grains. Sure, I understand the health benefit and all of that. But if you put the feet, the soaked feet and the fermented feet fermented feet is feet that has soaked long enough so it has started that fermenting process next to a chicken i can guarantee you almost all the time the chicken will go to the not soaked and not fermented feet <laughs> it's guys it's just what it is let the chicken tell you what they want i mean you can't ferment it you can't soak it it it'll you know you have to feed less it'll increase the volume it's it's also healthy for the chicken's gut but i'm not such a strong preacher of that okay it, it also makes it a pain to handle you can do that for your homestead chickens but if you have you know 10 chicken tractors you do not want to carry heavy buckets of fermented feed around it's i mean so much extra work and and all of that i had a conversation with joel salatin about this when i visited his farm and there's just no way but generally let's say sprouting grain you know it's also you need to have a setup for that you need to have um the equipment for it it's a great thing i mean it unlocks a lot of things a lot of beneficial things what what we had when we had our chickens um our layers in the greenhouse tunnel in the winter time we would have them on deep bedding we would spread um, a few handful of grain into the deep bedding so that they would scratch a lot and um and when they Sorry, I just had something weird happen on my computer here. It's sunset and altered into dark mode. I just was wondering if something crashed. Uh, anyway, they scratched and looked for the grains and they didn't find all of them. And, and some of them then sprouted in the deep bedding by themselves and provided some fresh greens for the chickens. Here is my thing when it comes to chicken feed. When I have a stable, financially stable and sound farm operation going in the States on our new farm, when we have reached that point, you know, and that'll be where I don't have to buy any grains, that'll be grass, okay? Whether it's geese or sheep or cows, you know, it, it'll be something like that. And, and whatever chicken will start with, I don't want to have more then I can feed for free off the land. But when we will experiment with poultry that requires higher input feed like chicken, I, I will either wanna to try to grow my own, own grain, okay? And then I, I might, if I'm able to do that, I might look into sprouting grains, but what I am more interested in doing is um, raising insects for chicken feed and duck feed, okay? That's what I'm more interested in. So I, I don't know if that completely answered your question, but okay. Uh, let's do one more question, guys. We have been at it for a long time already. Um, do you have any breeds you recommend for egg production? Yes, I do. So you give, this gives me the opportunity real quick to, to say you can put layers in a chicken tractor. You add nesting boxes. We did this. Just make sure you don't add too much weight so that you can move it. You can't have as many in those chicken tractors by far, but it still works great. You do daily moves and all of that. Especially, I would definitely recommend a, a design model like this one where you can stand tall uh, and walk into the chicken tractor. Okay? I would not recommend... Um, this design here, the Salatin style, that this, that's not what I would recommend for, um, for layers in the chicken tractor. Now, if, um, one thing I want to show you here, guys, is I took one picture 
This is an Eggmobile. I built this in Sweden after a design from Polyface Farm. There are many different kinds of Eggmobiles. An Eggmobile is something different than a chicken tractor. That's a big mobile chicken coop, a mobile hen house, okay? And that is typically more normal for layers. But if you don't have so many, if you're on a homestead, you can either use a chickshaw. I actually have a picture for you guys for that as well. Chickshaw, where do I have that picture? From Justin Rhodes, oh, it's missing here. I do not have the picture. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the Chickshaw from Justin Rhodes, I have also built one of those in Sweden. That could work for your layers, but if you wanna do it in a chicken tractor, use one that you can walk into. And so breeds, do you have any breeds? Um, <laughs> I love heritage breeds. I love dual purpose breeds because they are dual purpose. I can use the roosters for meat. The hens still make good stewing hens at old age and I love their eggs. But listen carefully. That might be a okay choice for you on the homestead. But if you want to sell eggs, if you want to make money doing it, then especially with the feed prices that you have right now, I would highly recommend that you, when you make your decisions holistically based on all of it, and your finances are obviously part of that, you need to run those decisions. Should I get hybrid layers or not? What kind of hybrid layers? There are different ones and you need to, you need to think of that. Okay, don't just dismiss it. Guys, for years, I refused, I refused, and I was very strong in my stance on that. I refused to use hybrids, whether it was meat or layers. And he, I wrote about this um, a lot in my ebook, The Self-Sufficient Homestead. I wrote about how it cost me a lot of customers it made me suffer financially and I lost a lot of customers because listen, in general, heritage breeds, they lay a third less eggs and they eat a third more. When they get broody, they stop entirely and they are not as consistent with laying. So what does that do when you are trying to build a customer base and you're trying to sell those eggs? The customer is like, where are my eggs? Well, and then you have to explain that all. And why is my egg so much more expensive? And, so, and all of that. And I lost a lot of customers because they would then just go to the other farmer or back to the store because they still wanted their eggs. And you have to think of that, okay? We are right now in the process of fixing up a chicken coop here on this farm. I aired a video about that yesterday. We're going to air the videos of us doing that here next week, hopefully, if we get to it then. And we will only get like five, six, seven, eight chickens because we don't want to get more chickens than what we can feed with our kitchen scraps. I don't want to buy any chicken feed at this point here. You're only here for a few more months. And... I will buy hybrid layers, the brown ones, not the white ones. The white ones, I, I will never buy those. Why? Because I do want eggs and they are a reliable source. When we are in the States, we'd love to start with a breast again. We'd love to start with some Australorps. And I saw another um, question here uh, that's related to that. Simeon, what do you think about the Bielefelder chickens? I love them. I worked with them um, at two different occasions in Sweden. They were for a long time my second breed next to the Bress. And the looks of them, I think they are some of the most beautiful chicken out there. I, they are just so gorgeous. But the Bress just outperformed them by 20%. Okay. 
and the breast is like 20% under a hybrid. So you understand, or 10% or something, like you understand the difference. And I had to just choose my fights at some point. So I just went with the breasts. Okay. Um, that's, um, that's what I had to do. And, and, and again, guys, you can ask me this question. I can give you my input. But again, it'll depend on your specific holistic context. You are unique. Your farm is unique. You're, where you buy your feed and at what cost is unique. Your clients or customers are unique. What you want to raise them for is unique. And so when you make these decisions, hybrids or not, should I get breast? Should I get Australorp? Should I get New Hampshire? Whatever it is, use the holistic management framework. It'll help you to make the correct decisions and keep you on track to what you actually want the outcome to be. Okay. Take a couple more questions here. Um, do you recommend supplements like calcium or other minerals for their health? It helps a lot when the chickens are out on pasture. I found that they find a lot of um, vitamins, nu nutrients, minerals through insects and grass and herbs and all of that. When you mix your own feed, um, it is a lot more challenging. You need to definitely get some supplements to get, um, you know, the right proteins, the right minerals, the right vitamins, all that together. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks there who don't like feeding chickens eggshells. I do it. I even throw them whole eggs. They will not touch them when they're unbroken. As soon as I break them, they'll eat them. You know, there are some people who say you have to crush the eggs in small pieces. Otherwise, they pick on good ones. I've never had that issue. There are certain hens who do that, and you got to call them anyway. But he he here's also uh, in regards to this question. Um, one thing is there are different kinds of feed, okay? And a lot of people like the feed more where you still see parts of the grain and you can put your hand through it and you see, the, oh, there's some corn there and there's some wheat there and some some bean or something. And they like that a lot. And the, the companies who produce that kind of chicken feed, they mix in, you know, some, some vitamins and minerals and all that in powder form. Now, my experience is, and I have, you know, I've raised hundreds of, of birds at the same time. And you go through a lot of feed. Often they, they eat that stuff and then they have all that fine powder gets stuck. It just lays at the bottom of the feeder and they don't like that so much. So you either have to really push the chickens to, to eat that somehow. It's, it's, just, it's just a pain. And so I could never guarantee with that feed that my chickens were actually getting all the minerals and, and supplements that they needed into their system. Because these feed producers, that this it's like a crazy science of what they put in there at what combination and percentage. So I actually went and, and fed my chickens with um, crushed pellets where all that stuff was pre-mixed and, 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 and pushed into pellets. And that way I could guarantee that they did get all the vitamins and minerals and all of that. And when you do it that way, I do not think that you need to add um, any of that. I, I don't believe that. Um, and out on pastures, guys, it's amazing what the pasture does to the birds, how healthy they are when they have that access, okay? One thing that I do not like about the feed that's being produced in general is that they pride themselves in the fact that it is uh, absolutely vegetarian. Guys, chickens need animal protein okay they live off of insects and worms and and sometimes even frogs and all of that they go behind the like the birds in nature they go behind large herds of herbivores that trample everything in their way when they walk over mice or snakes or what or or, or locusts or whatever it is they crush with their hoofs when they run in panic the chickens are the cleanup crew. They eat all of that. They need the animal protein. So why in the world do we create ve vegetarian feed for our chickens, right? So hope that answers the question. Um, so you, you, somebody, you said, 
um, I'm only on a home scale, a homestead scale. Yeah, I understand that the principles remain the same though, whether it's big or small. Um, so I have silver laced wine dots and buff Orpington as well. I wanted to add the Bielefelder to this on my small homestead. This is a great comment for me to finish on. Um, this is a great comment for, to finish on because it, it helps can helps me now to, to just sum it all up. Um, you need to also do what brings you joy on your homestead, right? So you've had heard some critical thoughts from me about the cost of, of having poultry and chickens, the feed costs and all of that. But look, that's why it's so important that you, when you make these decisions, should I get chickens? What kind of chickens should I get? How should I raise them? What chicken tractor design? Where will I place that? What do I have to do otherwise? A stable coop, um, mobile coop. When you make these decisions, you have to think obviously of your finances. You have to think of the neighbors you know, how they will be affected. You have to think of your land, of, of your climate, everything. But you also have to think of what what you want, what brings you joy. If you love this breed, if you love the looks of that, if you love the silkies, you know, you then, you know, and that fits. Why do you want to keep them? Do you want to keep them for eggs? Do you want to keep them to, to produce something to sell to customers? Or do you also want to come home with a basket full of, 10 eggs and each egg has a different color, some green, some chocolate brown, some, you know, some people want that. And you need to make those decisions based on all these aspects of your life. That's holistic management, guys. That's so important. I can't stress this enough. That is one of my passions. And that's what we didn't do in Sweden. Listen, guys, one reason why we are not in Sweden anymore is because it didn't work out there for many reasons. And and, you know, the, had we managed holistically, we would have either been able to, to handle that or we would have been able to see the issue with it sooner and find a solution sooner. Okay? We had so many social weak links in that farming operation. You know? There, there are so many... So many things that we have to consider. And because we all try it, well, holistic management provides a framework for you, for me, so that we actually can do this successfully, guys. That's what I want to end with. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this chat. I hope you could really benefit from this. Um, again, before you go, maybe give it a thumbs up, a like, or a um, you know, hit that plus sign on Rumble to help us spread the word. Go check out our new website, thesoundfarmer.net, where you will find this online course about holistic management. If you're not sure, is this for me? What is holistic management? Why does it matter? Um, you know, uh, what can it do for me? That course will be amazing because it's it's fairly cheap. You do not have to invest much time into training. Also, our, you can consult with me on Bali about your specific homestead. I just added a whole consulting video to our website where you can actually see how that works. You can see how I consult a customer, a client on Bali. If you're wondering, can Simeon help me? How does he do it? Is what what is Bali? You can see that on the website now. If you go to the either the mentoring or the consulting part of our website, if you scroll down. There is a video where you can both learn from the actual consulting session. We're talking soil improvement. We're talking um, um, layout from of the homestead. We're talking hugel culture and raised garden beds and so on. You can learn from the actual content, but you can also learn how it is when you consult with me, guys. Um, also, with the consulting offers, we've just added a bunch of materials that when you purchase a consulting session with me you get the holistic management ebooks depending on what you order you get some of them more of them or all of them um, and so you don't just have that time with me but you have a bunch of things that you can just self-study with afterwards so thanks guys for watching again i appreciate you hope you have a wonderful weekend i'm super tired i'm super excited that we 
can go into the weekend now. I have to head out in a few minutes to take care of the cattle in the barn. Hey, let's all strive to become sound farmers. Bye-bye.